Hey gang, I thought I'd uh, touch base on uh, Mark's uh, comments to me about the uh, work th work up or review I did on on the video uh, on his game uh, Sticks and Stones. And uh, while I appreciate his uh, tortured effort to give me compliments in regards to being a quality reviewer, I would like to think of myself more as just a player who is uh, sharing his impressions. So. Uh, Thank you for the very kind compliment. I do want to address a couple of things that Mark mentioned in uh, his blog post, <clears throat> which I encourage you to read because he brings up some really important points about the new design and uh, and my comparisons to World of War and stuff like that. And uh, obviously I only use World of War as a foil at, for comparison because it's more than likely that many folks who are playing World of War or have played World of War and like it will no doubt like this game but for different reasons uh, and also I think folks that are following uh, Mark and his adventures are most likely fans of World of War and so your first thing you're going to ask is well why is it different and what's different about it right hence my, hence my commentary but Mark made a couple of comments and some good points about some of the gameplay aspects that I missed which I thought I mentioned <clears throat> and, I, and I must I've must, I been mean, thinking that I did and I think the kids wandered through and splashed me with water and Next thing you know, the, the uh, half-assed script that's in my head has uh, disappeared. But the couple of uh, things that are really different about this game that I did want to make uh, mention of. So in this, and I've got the, the rules here with me, because this time I'm not going to forget. Uh, <clears throat> the sequence of play. So first of all, the counter art is very different. I think I mentioned that to you already. And the numbering sequence, the numbers on the counters and what they're for are different. And Mark takes good advantage of color as well to represent different aspects of, of the game, uh, which is important. So there's this uh, drawing of cards business that we talked about and, uh, you know, your rally phase and all that sort of stuff. But then it's the fire phase and the movement phase and the close assault phase. And I think I referenced earlier on that the close assault phase was a separate function as opposed to in, uh, in some other games you move and attack, right? So all in the one thing. So the assault becomes a function of movement. Well, here it's separate and distinct, which changes the way you think about how you're going to assault something. So you can bring all your forces to bear on a particular part of the map, whatever the case might be. So that's kind of that, that was a cool thing. But the big difference in this sequence of play is the firing phase. Because the firing phase allows you to, as Mark mentioned in these blog posts, do this alternate firing action. So if you're the, uh, if you are, and there's another thing I've got to remember too, I just thought of. Uh, if you're the initiative holder, you get to fire first, which is always nice, so that you, you know, take out those high threat uh, or high, high value targets if you get first shot. But as always, you're going to have those, you know, the tough choices, what to take, what to take on first. But then you fire first and then the, your opponent fires. And that continues until both sides are done shooting. <coughs> so in essence, until both sides pass. So that is very different uh, for, given that in the movement phase, one side moves and then the other side moves. So there's no alternating there. So that's a, that's a little slice of uniqueness that I like about the system. And the other thing about, uh, and of course, it, if you have uh, in the movement phase, if you have this uh, capability, you have, if you have the initiative, you then have the capability to decide who moves first. And that can be pretty significant as well. So as the Americans, if you've got initiative, you're going to want the Soviets to move first, see where they're headed or whatever the case may be, because you're typically on the defensive. And you will uh, also uh, expose them to opportunity fire. Whereas if you're moving first, you're probably not going to not going to move as many guys if you're on the defense, because you want to um, you want to take advantage of opportunity fire. Plus, you don't want to expose yourself. Uh, and of course, if you don't uh, have up up fire uh, actions, then you can move. So some nice uh, tactical choices to be made there. And I've got my fingers crossed, and I'm trying to remember what it was for. Oops. <clears throat> there's this aid business, there's aid, these focus counters, I guess, or focus markers. You put them on the map for uh, diary rolls and for enhancements to morale. 
I like that idea. It's not clear to me how they are taken off the map and when, if they're used. So for instance, you, the, the focus markup has two dice on one side and one die. And then once, um, once you use it twice, does it go off the map and stay off the map until the next turn when you can then place it back down or are you done and that's it? So in the seven turns, you only get to use it twice. I wasn't clear necessarily on that. And the rules didn't seem to make that uh, clear as to when it was used. It does uh, Once it was used. So, you know, it says when they're... It talks about when they're used in the initiative uh, initiative section that it's removed from the initiative box. It doesn't say that you then place it back. I assume you do, but I don't know if it's a limited use piece of technology or if it's uh, you know a tool or if it's something that um, is used throughout the whole game. I would assume it's be used throughout the whole game. Now I did make a mistake when I was playing at one point. Uh, although the M109 managed to survive the massive combined firepower attack. Because what you do with uh, firepower, if you've got multiple units shooting, apparently you don't combine their, their firepowers, you just add uh, a column shift for the additional units. Now, that to me, that flies in the face of what the rules say, but I'll take that as verbatim, because that's what Mark said in his post. And the other thing that I do wrong uh, was also when I was reading the cards, the action cards, it's, it clearly says plus two firepower. But because every other modif modification in the game represents column shifts, I naturally assumed that they were column shifts as well. Um, perhaps uh, different... Um, I don't know, more clear terminology for for ding dongs like me. And just let me read you this this fire this fire combat rule um, because I'm trying to understand how it works. And maybe someone can comment and make a make a comment on. Uh, so to attack armored fighting vehicles, add the armor piercing firepower of the attacking units. Subtract the highest armor rating in the target hex. Okay, so we've got an Abrams with an attack factor of fourteen and a T-72 with a attack fact, uh, defense factor of 6. We subtract that, leaves 8. If I have two AFVs, the way I'm reading that rule is that it says I would add those factors together for 28 and then subtract the 6 and terrain and other things like that. Well, terrain actually is a column shift. So, Okay, so let's just keep reading in case there's something else in here that I... And then it says, uh, <clears throat> okay, I consult the appropriate column on the fire table, uh, modify the column as dictated by the terrain, and roll 2d6. The, res the result for both types of attacks are displayed as a number of possible hits. Use the rightmost column that the attack power, firepower equals or exceeds. And, and that's a little thing I didn't catch either. I had been rounding down, basically, uh, from one column to the left, basically, because it jumps from four to eight, and you end up in six quite often, so you know that pops you back down to four. But the way the rules read to me, unless there's something else in the rules somewhere, somewhere, uh, so that's just a clarification that maybe when the boxed edition comes out, can be made in terms of combined firepower. And nowhere in the uh, <clears throat> yeah multiple attacking units. If you look at the multiple attacking units section. Uh, oh, now I know what my fingers were crossed for. I remember it has to do with line of sight. Uh, it says every additional unit assisting shifts the fire results one column to the right. So really, all we need to do is uh, clarify that one unit we use one unit's firepower and not units firepower. Now, in an assault, it's different because you combine the firepower and the hex. Line of sight, here's, a, here's the thing. Uh, one, one of the aspects of uh, so a difference from World of War is that basically all, all vehicles can be seen even if they haven't shot. So as long as you have a line of sight to it, you can shoot at it, as far as I know. Uh, so that's another, another difference. Anyway, thanks for the kind comments, Mark. I wanted to just uh, sort of 
give you uh, some feedback on your comments. You made some really good points about things that I missed and that were actually valuable parts of the game that, uh, that I certainly enjoyed. I enjoyed the card play. I, I like the alt alternating fire because there's nothing, nothing worse than sitting there you know, uh, with, the, with the chip pull mechanic and some guy pulls three chits in a row and you're waiting for the action to come. So that side of things is very, very different from uh, anyone who's played World of War before. Uh, getting away from chip pulls, I think, is pretty cool. And also, there's no headquarter units in this, so you don't go on that bug, on that you know, kind of bug hunting, uh, headquarter hunting uh, exercise, which uh, kind of kind of breaks the uh, World of War game a little bit for me. Uh, anyway, that's all I got for you. We'll talk to you guys soon.